a another edition of the Wrestling Underground Podcast. I am your host, as always, Chad Fordo, and joining me is the glorious one himself, Marcus Green. Marcus, how are you? What's good, people? It'll be a good show. Cool, so, cool. before we hop into it, let's do the, the little runny downs. Uh, RealNerdCorp.com, R-E-A-L-N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P.com. If you like our show, you like our past shows, you want to follow us on the other shows, that's where you go. It's, it's a one-stop shop for all things us. Uh, we're on Twitter at N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P. That's at NerdCorp. We're also on Twitter at Wrestling Under G. Uh, we're on uh, Instagram at Real NerdCorp. Marcus, your personals are Paradox Kid, P-A-R-A-D-O-X-K-I-D. You can also find Don't him. Don't ask me. Yes, that is, that is him. You can also find him on his other, on his other podcast, The True Penny Show, on uh, Twitter at True Penny Show, T-R-U-E-P-E-N-N-Y-S-H-O-W. And you can find me as well as on Twitter at Chad NerdCorp, C-H-E-D-N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P, and on the Instagram at Chad's Photo Hut. So, we have a lot, but not a lot to talk about. Like, all the things we have are pertinent, but they're not going to be too in-depthful. That makes a lot of sense. This is, of course, your Wrestling Underground podcast, the one and only show you'll ever need to talk about, the, the real truth about pro wrestling. So, Marcus, let's, let's kick it off with, with, a, with a company that was going to be uh, causing a lot of real negative headlines in, in a real fast amount of time. That's Ring of Honor. Uh, for the sake of it, we will, you know, acknowledge that returning for TV tapings is fine. You know, depending on how they go about things, you know, there is no inherent criticism against that. These cats need to work. These, this company needs to make money. And I'm pretty sure these week by weeks that they're, they've been doing aren't exactly gaining, uh, garnering a lot of attention. Uh, so they're, they're ready to come back for some TV tapings here uh, at the end of the month, I believe. Uh, let's see. Uh, we'll resume to you sometime this month in their home state of Maryland. Uh, they will follow strict guidelines by the Maryland State Athletic Commission, and they will institute necessary testing and safety measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19 at the tapings. These will be the first TV tapings since the coronavirus pandemic hit earlier this year. They had recorded, I think, in January or February before everything happened. And they still had about four or five weeks left in the can. And they ran through those shows pretty fast. Brian Alvarez is reporting that there's uh, no word exactly on what they have planned, but said that for the hardcore fans, dedicated fans, they will be pleased by Ring of Honor's upcoming efforts, apparently. Alvarez said that he was told that if hardcore fans feel like they've been missing something from their pro wrestling as of late, then they will really enjoy what goes down at the tapings later this month. We've seen... Oh, we don't need to do that. Um, so my hope is that it's the return of the, uh, red apron rings, because <laughs> that would make me happy. I would be super into that, <laughs> but I also know, uh, that that era of Ring of Honor is long gone and dead. Uh, part of the problem with everything, though, is that we haven't gotten any headway on anything involving Marty Skrull. And that's kind of a big deal. Same thing with Jay Lethal. Uh, Ring of Honor said that they would investigate, but still yet we've, we've seen nothing. So I don't know exactly what we can expect from this going forward. Um, Marcus, you know, we haven't had anything to do with uh, anything involving Marty Skrull or, or uh, Jay Lethal news-wise. If they're still part of the roster come their first set of tapings, how does that affect you as a fan, and how do you think that'll affect the overall narrative against them or for them uh, heading forward? I mean, if I, like you said, if I see them when they, when they come back, I'm going to got to make an assumption because I obviously I can't know for sure that they're actively investigating and trying to find something definitively admonishing. Um, that I guess uh, 100% proves these allegations. They go kind of land on the side of what you know their talent however um in this particular climate with them trying to garner and regain momentum with this cup you know this court of of you know jump to conclusion public opinion that's not going to be good for the overall narrative specifically if you have people because it i mean it could be people just waiting to bring out more stuff you know, they might have, it might be some people waiting to see if they're going to actually put them back on some tapings just so they could drop more. Stuff. And then that's a run of sputter because a lot of people 
I was going to already demonize them for coming back in the first place. And it's mm-hmm. like, if you didn't, then there's the, also another narrative. It's like, well, you didn't really do too good before taking care of your talent before a pandemic, according to some people who formerly worked for you. So can we really trust you now during this pandemic? Like, can we trust to say that you actually are testing people properly? So it's a lot of it's a, it's a lot of things working against them in that regard. So they they got to the tread carefully. For me, seeing Jay Lethal, Marty Scroll don't necessarily turn me off of the product. But if stuff's starting to go left, I wouldn't be surprised. I think for me, it's going to be a very interesting situation because when it comes to the parent company of eight uh, of uh, that's a that Freudian slip of Ring of Honor. They are, uh, Sinclair Broadcasting is not exactly a reputable group of people. In fact, they were going to run a anti-pandemic interview on their, on their stations. And if you don't realize how big Sinclair Broadcasting is, you have a local channel in your area right now, I guarantee you, that is owned by Sinclair Broadcasting. It could be your NBC affiliate, it could be your Fox affiliate, it could be your ABC affiliate, but they have something like 160-odd channels, or stations, I should say, uh, that they own. So Marcus may have a CBS affiliate that's a, C- that's a Sinclair Broadcasting Group, and I may have, you know, uh, I, think, I think mine's actually is a CBS broadcast. Uh, and they also have uh, a nu- numerous amounts of other channels like Comet and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Charge, and, and I think Charge is where they air Ring of Honor. So there's a lot, you know, in that realm that they can control. So when it comes to investigating Marty Skrull and Jay Lethal, uh, I think the odds of them doing it is actually quite low. And, you know, I I don't think we're going to see any changes coming out of this. And and I think that's going to be unfortunate because even though I do like Jay Lethal and I've liked him for a long time as a wrestler with these sorts of uh, accusations against him and Skrull and Skrulls are atrocious. There's no real way you can bring them back without suffering some type of condemnation, either fairly or unfairly. Uh, you know, that, that's just kind of how that goes. We actually have a third story to add to this, but we'll, we'll hit MLW first before we get to the third one. Uh, apparently, MLW is uh, talking about possibly returning to do live events. Uh, uh, Court Bauer said he's the head of the company. I've been very encouraged by how UFC, M- uh, NBA, the NHL, Top Break Boxing, and DAZN Matchroom Boxing have managed operations as they restart. We're also seeing TV and film start back up in certain regions in a cautious manner, and that's the mindset you need to operate with during this moment in time. Caution. We are speaking with some of the sharpest minds at John Hopkins University in Medicine on a restart and talked with New, J- uh, New Japan's people and how they've approached it, and they've done an incredible job. Also, we've also engaged some of our athletes who have completed outside of MLW during the pandemic to see what, what has worked, what didn't, and what could be improved upon. It's very important to gather as much information, advice, medical an- analysis as possible, and that's what we've been doing. That analysis gives you the best ability to do your job and navigate the next steps in examining a restart. Uh, they are expected to reveal uh, their, their return sometime this month, but we don't know any uh, updates about that yet. Uh, Bauer said that he would not return to doing shows until he could do it in a way where his performers and staff are safe. Uh, he's also kind of, you know, th- there's some kind of persnickety-ness on the, uh, on the interwebs about how some guys haven't been getting paid during the pandemic and um, Brian Pillman has been wanting out and Davy Boy Smith Jr. and uh, Jacob Hammerstone has, have reportedly been uh, a little hard to get a hold of in regards of, of them contacting Court Bauer. Uh, so I don't know where MLW stands at the moment. Uh, some of this could be pandering. Some of this could be keeping contracts in place. Some of this could be, you know, just long-winded ways of trying to keep people satiated until something could happen. Or it could be the end. I don't know. Like, like the, We could see more shows, you know, announced in August for MLW, or they could never come back at this point. I, I wouldn't be surprised with either one. I'm hoping they do come back because even though they're only about eight or nine minutes long, Marcus, the pulp fusions they've been posting every week are brilliant. <laughs> they're covering the top guys. Um, Selena De Laurentiis is just abusing her, her, her staff. It's hilarious. Uh, she threw, it had to be a, a knockoff Gucci bag, but she threw a knockoff Gucci bag that they pretended was real into the pool. And she's, like, yelling at her assistant. She goes, 
what color is this? And, she, and the guy's like, ah. And she goes, is it pink? And the guy goes, no. And she goes, exactly. And she throws it in the pool. And then one of her other sisters goes, no, not the Louie. And jumps in after it. I was, I lost my shit. That was really good. Jacob Hammerstone uh, was on a, a, like a seven-week diet. And he was just crying the entire time because all he could eat was like salad. And he was just so sad. <laughs> it was great shit. Uh, and, and I think, um, oh, why do I always forget his name? Richard Holiday. He, he's doing some great shit, uh, always talking about his father slash lawyer and, and looking up uh, that in like some 40-year-old legal textbook that he is in fact named the uh, Caribbean champion. I'm like, that book's older than you are, bitch. Oh, uh, that's funny. So definitely check out Pulp Fusion. They're doing a lot of great shit. Uh, and they're doing this whole bit where Tom Lawler is trying to get to Hawaii to beat up the Von Erics, but he's trying to take his little buddy with him. But his little buddy can't go on a plane for some reason, so he put his little buddy into a a, 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 a carry-on luggage. So like you, you just hear the voice over the guy who's supposed to be in the luggage talking to Tom. It's it's fucking, it's so dumb, but in the best way possible. Ah, Paul Fusion has been very entertaining, and it's only like ten minutes long, so it's 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 a nice little jump in point. Marcus, have you been watching any uh, MLW, be it the Underground stuff, the uh, the past episodes, or uh, the, uh, the Pulp Fusions? Yeah, I caught a couple of Pulp Fusions. Uh, it's just uh, I probably got to get back into the, um, in terms of like getting a little backstory on the character, but it is some very entertaining stuff. It all it actually reminds me of a lot of stuff that we've seen in Impact, mm-hmm. but it kind of characters do their thing. Um, you can tell they, they do give their talent a lot of freedom, which is why. You know, you, you can tell when a lot of these talents are having fun as opposed to having to do something that they're told to do that's clearly not only out of character, but out of their um, personal range of, of entertainment. So, you know, that, that benefits them a lot. So the third company that we have to talk about making their comeback is the NWA. I don't think the rumors about them going out of business were as far-fetched as people believe. I think when Raven said that, he had heard information that may have been old, but may have been accurate. Mostly, uh, my thought process is that this is a Hail Mary uh, idea by the NWA. They have launched a uh, United Wrestling's Network primetime live. Uh, The NWA is teaming with the pro wrestling sanctioning body that promotes championship wrestling from Hollywood and championship wrestling from Arizona. That's the promotions owned by the Marquez family. Dave Marquez does a lot of the interviews on the NWA uh, weekly television show. Uh, So that obviously a a connection with that uh, is still ongoing. Uh, Dave Marquez was one of the biggest promoters of the NWA before Billy Corgan bought the NWA when the NWA was still a bunch of territories. Dave Marquez was arguably the biggest promoter of that era of the NWA. Uh, the weekly pay-per-view, uh, they, they are launching a weekly pay-per-view model. Uh, they don't have a price point yet, but the first 90-minute episode will debut September 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard, uh, and it will air on both Fight TV and traditional pay-per-view services on cable. Thunder Studios is hosting the event in its Long Beach studios and will be taking COVID-19 precautions. I believe Thunder Studios might be owned by Thunder Rosa. We'll see if we can confirm that. Uh, it's a fully integrated facility. Uh, let's see. We're, we're Googling this as we speak. Our, our prep time for the show has been tremendous. Uh, let's see. Maybe it's not. Stages contact. Who can we contact at Thunder Studio? Uh, eh, looks like my theory was wrong, but still, they're working together with Thunder Studios. So at least they, you know, they they have some plans. Uh, Billy Corgan went on to say, "I'm pleased that we are finally able to announce some good news, and in pan- uh, partnering with the United Wrestling Network, we'll be able to get back to work with what promises to be top tier ma- matchups and soon." It goes without saying, but yet he's going to say it anyway, that 2020 has been a challenging year for everyone, and our goal is in reestablishing an in-ring NWA action was to make sure our talent would be well protected within the new established safety protocols, as well as delivering constant high-quality content like our vaunted shows, NWA Purr, 
and 10 pounds of gold. <clears throat> but this will be more than just a weekly live pay-per-view broadcast as we plan on shooting additional content for the uh, NWA YouTube channel and, pa- and our Patreon subscribers. Our goal here is simple, to provide the best contest possible. Yada, yada, yada. I always want to produce, uh, Dave Marquez goes on to say, I've always wanted to produce a joint program that would feature the baddest and best pro wrestlers from different promotions on, on the same broadcast. This fan-first way of thinking should allow us to present matchups that you might not normally see on our weekly television. There may be a time when you see someone from Championship Wrestling from Hollywood go up against someone from Chicago's Freelance Wrestling or even the fighters out of the LA Dojo in New Japan versus West Coast Pro Wrestling. A major goal we have is to take newer up-and-coming athletes and present them in a way that hasn't been done on a nationally televised show before with this incredibly new platform and opportunity to let great sound shine on a national stage. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Marcus, NWA's coming back September 15th. Uh, kind of have to do the format that they're doing, I think, mostly because half of the NWA roster no longer works for them. <laughs> We've yeah. seen Anderson, Mr. Anderson leave, uh, Ricky Starks leave, Ziggy Dice is, I guess, gone or maybe not. You know, uh, there were rumors that maybe James oh. Storm was going to pop back up an impact. So, yeah, Tosh is over there. Yeah, yeah Tosh is over an impact. So, you know, uh, I, the the, uh, the uh, Ricky Morton and, and Scott Gibson, right? That's the name, Scott Gibson. I think that's his name. Uh, they're over in AEW for at least a spell. So, it, you know, they, they, they uh, Eddie Kingston's gone. <laughs> Holy mm-hmm. shit, there's a lot more guys that's gone than I realized. I wouldn't be at all surprised if Homicide pops up on, uh, on Impact. Wouldn't even be a little surprised. Uh, so, this is kind of the, where, where they had to go. They probably have most of their female fighters, wrestlers. Um, but outside of that, like, it seems like a lot of their talent, you know, has been, you know, decimated. C.W. Anderson retired. You know, we don't know what the, uh, the status is on some of the other guys that they got there. You know, they can't use Marty Skrull if they don't want to be, uh, have backlash. So that means Nick Aldis's, you know, opponents have, uh, greatly decreased in terms of name value. Seems like the way yeah. to go, though, like, in, in their current format. But Marcus, would you pay, let's say, you know, because, uh, Impact did this when they were NWA TNA. They, they charged $9.99, $9.99 for pay-per-view every week. Let's just say that they're going to charge $4.99 a week for the sake of argument. Marcus, would you pay $4.99 a week to watch NWA's 90-minute show? $4.99 in this climate where I basically... A lot of people still basically have a cable bill because all the streaming service they probably have on top of their other bills. Not everybody's getting that stimulus package. I know I didn't get I the first know. one. <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting. I don't know. Like I said, they they got a severely dwindled uh roster, but they do still have names like Nick Aldis, Tim Storm, um, Eli Drake. Storm, um, they got Thunder Rosa, Molina. They they still got name. I mean, they basically still have all of um, what is all this faction name? The oh, something business, risky business. Is that it? Strictly business. Strictly business. Um, Terrible name yeah. business. They got the Pope. They got still the got the Pope. Be cool to see. Him. Yeah, be cool to see him pop back up in Impact, but. Oh, they still got some names. I, I might I might be able to scroll together like what you said, four ninety nine? Yeah, so twenty bucks a, week. a month. Yeah, I might I might do that. I might do that. But if we get to a point where I have to pick food over in, in food over them with like these delivery services, I'm going with my belly. So <laughs> Gotta get the grub hub on. <laughs> oh yeah. You know it. Speaking of going with your gut, let's talk about uh, Raw Underground because it's a thing. Uh, so Medusa got mad at Raw Underground in week one because they had scantily glad dancers. <gasps> oh, no. And then Lance Storm's like, AEW? what's that? You seen AEW? Oh, uh, yeah, that's true. Although I don't mind cheerleaders. 
<laughs> so, so they got scantily clad dancers, and then Lance Storm chimed in, well, I don't mind if they have scantily clad women, but how about when the men come out, or when the women come out, we get scantily clad men? And I'm just sitting there going, shut up, Lance. <laughs> Let's be honest, pro wrestling still caters mostly to men. <laughs> Sorry if that offends. If, if, if scantily clad women upset you, then why are you watching women's matches to begin with? I'm I'm just I'm putting it out there, folks. Like you you can't be like, oh, look at how beautiful Alexa Bliss is in her ring gear. She's so strong and powerful. And then slut shame the dancers. How the freak you feel about boxing ring girls? Then like what what like I don't like this selective feminist crap. Like it, it's, it's, I, I would assume in Medusa and Landstorm's defense, they would probably be even with that. Truth be told, like they would be just as, as much of a problem with that. But I'm of the mindset that unless you're advocating for men and women to wear, like, long sleeve baggy clothes, what's the difference between a ring girl, a dancer, or a wrestler in terms of their aesthetic? Like, look at what Liv Morgan wears or, or, you know, Charlotte Flair. Her tits are in your face every week. Her right. Her right to do that. But how is one empowering and the other one something to be, uh, you know, to, to, to shame. Like, I, I, that's where my issue lies, Marcus, because everyone in pro wrestling, everyone in sports to a degree is selling sex to a, to a point. That's why competitors in the UFC wear nut-hugging shorts on their six-pack abs and their shoulders with muscles on muscles on muscles. They're selling the physical representation of physical perfection. Because they know that sells. They know that good-looking people in good shape sells. There's a reason why people like Paige Van Zant and Luke Rockhold get you know major fights, because they look pretty. You know, John Jones ain't just marketable because he he he's a good steroided up fighter. It's because he's a handsome young dude. Well, he's like my age, so maybe he's not that young. But like, wh- where's the outrage when when we see you know like. Uh, you know, women posting half-naked, you know, posts on their Instagram. Like, I don't see Medusa getting all uptight about that. You cannot pick it. and choose when you get angry. That, that's what, that's right where I'm at. Now, this is what I'm saying. What if it's the same scenario, but it's three sunny kisses? Empowering, so beautiful, dynamic. <clears throat> Diverse. Diverse. Uh, okay. And that's coming okay. from the black dude. <laughs> And, and, you, and, and do you know that like Sunny Kiss is more? Uh, it's, <laughs> Sunny Kiss probably dances better and wears tighter stuff than the girls that was on the show. I wouldn't doubt that. But <laughs> so, so like what? Like, again, like pick and choose. Like she and, and like and I like I'm saying it'll be different if she, she was like in the company, which I don't doubt she probably still do because she don't give a damn. It's a woman that drives monster freaking trucks, but you ain't even a, like Bianca say you don't even go here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't even go here. <laughs> you fucking telling Dasha Fuente she about to have her first one of her uh, few wrestling appearances on TV and, and uh, on on the show. Like, God, they just stay over there, please. Like, I, like I get it, but none none of these people ever keep the same energy across the board, which nope. is why they should just shut up. <laughs> I, for one, am of the mindset that if you want to put scantily clad people out there, go for it. If they're cool with doing it, do it. If they're not cool with doing it, don't do it. But if they're cool with it, do it. I don't understand why we have to police every little thing. Some women are fine with being eye candy. Some men are fine with being eye candy. The, the point of emphasis shouldn't be not letting those people exist, but allowing people who aren't fine with being eye candy the right to opt out of being presented as eye candy. If you're not yeah. comfortable with it and you speak up and you're still forced to do it, I'm on your side. Okay. And I got your back. But if you're fine with it, they're fine with it, you're making money and you're having fun, then who the fuck is Medusa to judge? And Liv Morgan, Man, you... lo- love Liv Morgan to death right now. She's like, can you bring back the dancers, yo? <laughs> no, it's cheap. Look, man, she and, and it's funny because, and I'm, it, it sucks that I'm turning in this guy, but we do have, I mean, if, if this thing with all these, uh, this wrestler outing has taught us anything, that we need to call people out. Mm-hmm. Um, when we see this crap, whether it's, you know, our own gender, what have your friends or otherwise. And I think she was replying to a dude that was like, well, I didn't like the dancers, 
I, you know, I think it works against everything the revolution stood for. I'm like, you just trying to randomly kiss some ass so you can feel like you're on the right side of history or get in good with one of these female wrestlers you secretly want to sleep with but can't express on Twitter anymore because you be handed your ass. Yeah. Yeah, you're not wrong. As far as the criticism to Raw Underground goes, it's pretty deep. Uh, the, the idea is still solid. I, I, I'm actually a proponent of the concept, just not WWE's version of it, because <laughs> it's bad. Um, but Ken Shamrock of Impact Wrestling is like, if you want someone to help you out, let me know. I'll come in and help you out. Now, Ken was very clear with saying that he does not want to participate in Raw Underground. He wants to help coordinate the fights, so to speak. <laughs> He's he not wrong because I don't think you caught it actually because you try to save your brain cells. But they did the thing last night, and it's interesting because of the people they're bringing in, right? Um, but they also having them go back and forth. So last week, one of the Viking Raiders was on in there, the strong people, and this week he's back goof trooping with um, on the show with freaking Ricochet and Cedric Alexander. Cute. But um, this week, Shayna Baszler showed up. And it ended up nobody would get in the ring with it. And of course, they had some women there. And she just dragged one of the chicks in there and started tearing up. And two other girls jumped in. And it, it came down to a situation where it was just her and all three of them stood up. And they went after it. Two of them was kind of like they charged her and it was holding it. And then the other girl literally, she literally walked over and literally was looking like she was trying to find the space. And I was like, this looks like like very poorly choreographed version of the Mortal Kombat sequence where it was like, this is where you fall down. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Cage! Like, at first it didn't look good, but then it's like, oh my god, this is so choreographed. And it's, like, it's, it's bad, man. It's, like, it's, it's, just not, it's just not good. What I do want to see, though, is Brock just show up one day and just kill everybody. You know, if you really want to, you know, sell me on getting back into Raw, bring in Dan Severin, <laughs> 63 years old, just walks in, puts someone in a front face lock and, and renders him unconscious for real. Oh, that would be amazing. Uh, let's talk about something that will be good. Uh, first ever knockouts Iron Man match set for Impact Wrestling Emergence. That's not all. We have the full two nights. Uh... So this is happening in two weeks. We may get another match or two added to the, uh, probably just another match added tonight too. Because I would imagine that the world title match will go 20 minutes, plus the Jordan Grace match will go 30 minutes. That's 50 minutes of content right there. Uh, what is it usually? Uh, two hour show, usually about an hour and 20 minutes. So you got about 68, 70 odd minutes. So you probably have enough time to squeeze in one more small match on night two if you want but you don't have a lot of extra time then by doing that um <clears throat> so here's the here's the cards for night one then night two night one has the motor city machine guns versus the north for the world tag team titles uh the good brothers versus ace austin and madman fulton uh Taya valkyrie versus kylie ray moose versus trey miguel for the tna world heavyweight championship and then chris bay versus rohit reju versus tjp for the impact x division championship then night two will have Deanna Parrazzo versus Jordan Grace for the 30-minute Iron Man, not four, excuse me, in a 30-minute Iron Man match for the Impact's not going to I'm going to read that again because I was fludging, fludging all the flubber fludgingness. Deanna Parrazzo versus Jordan Grace in a 30-minute Iron Man match for the Impact Knockouts Championship. Take that one to the pit. And then you have, of course, Eddie Edwards in his open challenge for the Impact World Championship. Marcus... I'm psyched for this. Like, for it, for basically being free TV and knowing that some of these matches won't only go six or seven minutes, which isn't a bad thing. I, I think we need to get that stigma away from wrestling. We only win seven minutes. Well, fuck you. You only lasted three minutes in bed, but I don't make fun of you for that. <laughs> Actually, I would. Seven, man, six of those were foreplay. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> You're Ryan Reynolds from Waiting. <laughs> yeah. Ah, that movie is so not going to fly in 2020. Oh, man. So, I think these are solid ma uh, matches for a free show. 
obviously the big sell, I think, in my opinion, in terms of quality is Parazzo versus Grace. Uh, I, I thought that her first match was fine. Parazzo needs to work on her cardio. She needs to, you know, work on getting back in shape, which I think she's going to. She seems like a pro. Uh, so I think this 30-minute 30, uh, man, uh, 30 minute Iron Man match will be a lot better than what we got from them at their pay-per-view at Slammiversary. Uh, thoughts on the card at large, and, and if there's anything about this that you don't like, do like, think would be better, or would have wished to see instead? No, I dig it. I like it all. Like I said, you've been watching the, the product consistently. All these matches make sense. You know, all these matches have been built up to. Um, you know, you might say that it feels like the exhibition match is random, but there's some stuff. First of all, Chris Bay just got the title. He's done with the Mac. Obviously, Mac's attention is very much occupied elsewhere. Um, and this whole thing with Rohit is interesting because, you know, um, he could very well squeak out with the win here because, like, he's almost purposely putting himself as the weak link to, like, dive under the radar because not only, like, he did, did he just ran, randomly volunteer to kind of be base setup man slash hype man in a way, but he also, like, the punk or, uh, you know, um, goat TJP, I should say, into coming back to the exhibition to compete. So now that he's kind of slid in that match, there's a very good opportunity that, you know, they won't be paying too much attention to me. And uh, what, what does he call himself? The guy that shines brighter than the sun or whatever? Something like that. Uh, yeah. So you can, you can squeak out with that win. I'm expecting Bay to retain because I would hate to see him drop it that fast. Um, and I, I think that would be a poor decision, but it would be cool if he came like like inches away and then now him and you know Bay got to question his motives I think that probably I, already... I'm sorry I didn't mean to cut you off but I think the idea that you presented of Raju winning that would be yeah. interesting <laughs> oh my god that would be phenomenal because <laughs> like he wouldn't win it cleanly right like he would backslide Bay and and like hook the rope and and he'd cheat Bay out of it. But I think I feel like the, the cheating Bay out of a, a win, because that'd be like the ultimate like slap to the villain's face. Like the, the villain loses the same way he wins. That's something you build up, yeah. for, I think. But the ultimate finesse got finessed. Exactly. What do you know? But I think that's well, definitely something you yeah. build up to. I don't think you jump to that, you know, four months, three months after he debuts. Yeah, that's I mean, if not. anything, I, Bay, I can see Bay. Like like a TJP set up or something, and then Bay using like Rohit as a human shield, and then you know hitting like that uh, springboard uh, cutter to get the win. Like that that's that's there's so many different options for Bay. Um, but yeah, I, I love the call. Like I said, I'm definitely looking forward to um, Deanna and and Jordan. I think that's a perfect match for them after the stuff that happened. Uh, yeah, I think I liked that first match more than you. I felt like it had a, a good ruggedness to it. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking forward to see what we put together for this one. And um, definitely going to be interesting to see who comes out for the open challenge. So, uh, and then Moose and, and, and uh, I think Moose and, and uh, Trey. Miguel could be, a, yeah, Trey could be a sleeper, you know, because, you know, Trey's been putting himself in a lot of positions to show what he got too. And I mean, he literally had the highlight of um, Slam Reverser. So, mm -hmm. Uh, do you think, pardon the language, do you think the girth of, of night two is sufficient or would you like to see one more match? Because you are basically spreading out the entire two-hour show for two matches. Now, granted, these aren't going to be slap-ass matches by any means. Eddie and, and, and Deanna are two of the better workers. Jordan has always shown she can go. And more than likely, I think, considering they wouldn't have him win, EC3 might make sense as the challenger, or they might do Eric Young. Either way, that's you know a worthy enough match to be on that card in terms of quality. Would you like to see one more match get added, or do you feel like the, the bountifulness of the two matches across the night would be sufficient? I wouldn't put it past them to have something, you know, like, like look, man, Slate is still trying to work. You know? Mm -hmm. So I try to mosey on out there and prove himself against somebody and then uh wow what if it be a situation where the guy he ends up having to beat uh although this doesn't seem like something scott would do because he's not malicious but it would work in like if you want this guy here so bad why don't you give him a shot and it's rhino that he has to beat 
I, th- I I like the idea, but we would have to incentivize it because I don't want to just do Rhino goes all villainy. So like, give Rhino like mm-hmm. a, like, like an ultimatum, <clears throat> or like Sofia Vergara says on on uh, Modern Family, an ultimatum. Uh, put Rhino in a situation where it's like if you beat Heath, you know Heath doesn't get a contract, but if you do win, we'll give you a shot at Eddie. Although Eddie could just show up, uh, Rhino could just show up anyway because it's an open challenge. So that does that idea doesn't really work. <laughs> so maybe not. I don't know. I'm excited for it though. It's gonna be a fun card. Uh, we have news on Brandy and Cody though. So apparently, uh, Cody revealed why Brandy left social media, and it was allegedly because she was getting an amount of n bombs, which is the uh, uh, I guess Cody's. Uh, a way of saying uh, uh, the N word. I don't not believe him because I, I'm sure, you know, if anyone's. Dude, I get racist slurs thrown at me. <laughs> so I can't only imagine what Brandy Rhodes gets. Um, but I don't feel like that's completely the truth, if that makes sense. Like that, it, I, I believe it's happening, right? I, I believe it's 100% happening. But I believe it's been happening for however long she's been on social media. So I don't believe that is the catalyst for why she left. Does that make sense? Am I being clear? Mm-hmm. I believe she left because she was getting a lot of heat from other angles. You know, the, the, her thirst traps during, you know, the, the speaking out movement was totally unprofessional. Even I sent her a tweet criticizing her about it. And I, I'm not usually one to, to you know hop in on the troll train. I don't feel like what I did was trolling either. I, I believe it was fair criticism for someone who's the head of a pro wrestling company. Uh, she also got a lot of flack for the heels uh, idea. Uh, and, and here's another thing. She, she deleted her Twitter, but not her Instagram. So I, I do believe that, you know, the idea that she left because of any amount of racial uh, uh, slurs is, is completely overblown. I believe that's Cody trying to give his, his uh, wife a nice way out. Uh, but Brandy posted on uh, Instagram saying, uh, AW Heels was a massive success last night. We exceeded the number of membership signups necessary to continue to move the fan club onward and forward. Uh, sorry, onward and upward. Thank you, every single person that joined last night and those with memberships that were unable to make it. Uh, the best is yet to come. Our call last night announced, uh, allowed us to uh, use to browse the full capability of the website community, offering members a dashboard with profiles where they can post photos, pit bios, and send receive private messages if desired. The post section was overwhelmed with chatter about the event with members connecting on various aspects of the Zoom session. Members were able to see new exclusive merch items. Uh, This sounds stupid. It was lively and lightning, the Q&A section was. Uh, The biggest takeaway is that people were happy. Oh, good. Oh, good for you. Uh, Cody Rhodes seems to have deleted his tweet, by the way, explaining why Brandy Rhodes left Twitter. That or he blocked me. That tweet delete stuff is always interesting. Um, All right. He did not block me, so he deleted it. Yeah, but, um, maybe he thought end bombs was too offensive. But, um, I mean, at this point. Wouldn't put it past people to say, oh, I don't appreciate you saying that, Cody. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of with you on that. I mean, isn't her official title the chief brand officer? Yeah, because she likes to call herself the chief brandy officer, and she's the brand DeLorean. She's so, Marcus, she's so unique with her bad puns. Yeah, we, we're not a fan of bad puns here. <laughs> but we are a fan of good puns. Oh, uh, yeah, it's like like you said, that, that if you're that brand officer, you should be the one doing a lot of um, fire containment during a time in which they was catching heat for the Gaval, specifically for the Gaval stuff. Yep. Um, and then obviously you, you had stuff, uh, you had stuff with um, the guy on commentary and then also the, the Ralph Roberts thing, which clearly gone under the rug. But um. Yeah, that's not what was happening. What was happening was um, a brand DeLorean business as usual. And I could I could understand d- ducking Twitter with keeping Instagram because there's money to be made on Instagram, whereas Twitter can just drive a lot of noise. Mm-hmm. You know, because if she's over there, 
she I mean because a lot of times you see people promoting bikinis and products which are nine times out of ten probably paid advertisements you know those companies probably paid you know sending out feeds that's why a lot of you know you see a lot of stuff with a lot of these quote-unquote IG models is because those those people get paid um, for that for that view for the, uh, for, the for their viewership so um, yeah but I definitely don't put it uh, past people to, to be giving her the um, the racist tweet. I mean, a lot of people will get probably get that same stuff and just don't say anything about it. Mm-hmm. They're thinking like it's one hundred percent trash. But um, I also would imagine that a lot of that particular horrendous rhetoric that is not justifiable got inflamed by her lack of um, brand management during those uh, allegations. You know, they probably use that as an excuse to do it even more. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate thing. There's fair criticism in attacking, I don't want to say attacking, but in criticizing Brandy and Cody for their behavior as of late, especially when it comes to Justin Roberts, Sammy Guevara, Jimmy Havoc. You know, they're looking the other way on a lot of these accusations, and it's very clear that Cody is very much a Vince McMahon ideologue in a lot of ways. But that should not open up the, the floodgates to the bigots who are looking for any reason yeah. to tear Brandy down to be clear before all the speaking out stuff, before all the Jimmy Havockness and, and all the, the, the nonsense going on with Cody, I was a big fan of the roads. I loved Brandy. Oh, I got, I got restraining orders to prove it. <laughs> Just no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but I was a big fan of Cody. I was a big fan of Brandy. But, you know, that, that whole mantra that's, you know, been repeated ad nauseum since, you know, March, you know, when people show you who they are, believe it. I'm, I'm taking that to heart. I'm taking that to heart. It's one thing to be media silent, right? Like, maybe you don't know the right thing to say. Maybe you're overwhelmed. Maybe, maybe emotionally you're conflicted and you don't know how to respond. I get that, and I don't, I don't mind that. Like, even if you're the head of a company, I think that's okay. It's okay to not know what to say at times. What I have a problem with is pretending that everything's fine while your company's being accused of housing rapists, abusers. Uh, um, uh, uh, I don't know what Justin Roberts qualify as. He's not technically a pedophile, uh, but he's a sexual deviant. That's for damn sure. Uh, and, and, you know, just, just the general shittery that is that company. And then you have Excalibur, you know, you know saying the N-word. And, and, and all, all before that, you know, his boss is like, we... we you know, Hulk and Linda Hogan are never allowed here because of the language they've used before. and we, we, we ban people like that. And it's like, well, do you? <laughs> so, you know, and, and there's just so many other minor things like, you know, how, they're tampering with, with other uh, workers when they have contracts. And, you know, just there, there's a lot of scummery going on. With, you know, Cody's embracing of, of nepotism for a hiring technique. Their refusal to actually admit when things aren't working. Uh, the constant uh, uh, the, uh, uh, conf- conflict of interest between the boys and, and the show. You know, Cody's the executive, and, and his TNT segments are always, like, 30 minutes long. Gee, I wonder why. He's fucking Vince McMahon 2.0. So there's a lot of criticism that's fair. But to use it to springboard into hatred that you've already had, it's like, no, I... I, I yeah. th- Brandy's criticism is mine. Like, you, you all can sit down. This is fair criticism. Let people who actually have fair criticism have the opportunity to voice their opinions. Because whenever I say something and then somebody else just goes, yeah, you N-word, it's like, well, you just now, now you messed us into the same grouping and we're not the same person. We're not both trolls. I'm a critic. He's an asshole. Granted, I, I too am also an asshole, but not in this moment. <laughs> so it's frustrating because... There's fair criticism, but there's also a lot of people who are just being slap asses. Yeah, no, you're 100 percent right. And like I said, um, I don't uh, fault anybody for getting off Twitter because it could be a very uh, severely toxic environment. I don't think a lot of times, a lot of times, I think people assume that they're stronger than they are, um, and then a the moment presents itself as like, wow, that really, that particular statement or um, slur or whatever hit me a different way and you know they sit on and think about it all day and it's not healthy and specifically when you're getting that all in your dms and and you know all in your implies you almost can't pay attention to the good stuff so 
Uh, but I do think they do need to do a better job of uh, being consistent when it comes to, you know, handling this stuff probably. Because a lot of times what you see is a lot of people will just go dark when a situation like what they're going through come up. And I get it, and that's not, no pun intended with their actual uh, program. But, you know, you got, to, you got to address stuff when stuff is trying to address you. You know, specifically when you're the new booty on the block. Mm -hmm. so. You're not wrong. You're not wrong at all. So let's talk about AEW Future on TNT because it might not have much of one. The guy who brought them in, Kevin Riley, has exited Warner Media amid major restructuring. Now, if you're paying attention to what's happening with Warner Media, you are aware that the entirety of everything they own is, is being shifted. Warner Media owns DC Comics, and DC has not just laid off members of DC. Uh, what was the name of the service? DC uh, Universe. Yeah, DC Universe. Practically everyone who worked on DC Universe is gone. So, like, you all have like two dudes named Mitch and Cam just kind of hanging out in, in, in the basement uh, of Warner Studios, uploading things to the service. Like, that's all they have left. No production studios, no directors, no content creators. They're all gone. Uh, then you have DC Comics have laid off a, a, a big amount of their uh, uh, workforce as well. Not a majority, but enough to make a sizable impact. And apparently Kevin Riley is part of the ousting as well for the group. Uh, he was brought in basically uh, to facilitate live sports for them, I believe. And uh, during his tenure, they landed a deal with one championship that has netted nothing. One championship has been just so poorly used on TNT. I don't even know if they're still technically airing them anymore. But two years ago or 18 months ago, that was a big deal. Like, you know, we're going to have one championship. We're going to have live pay-per-views. And, you know, we're going to have, you know, recap shows. And I think they did it for like two months. I don't know if they're still doing it, but I haven't seen anything about it. Uh, Variety is reporting that Bob Greenblatt and Kevin Riley are exiting the company, while Warner Media CEO Jason Kilar made the announcement in a staff memo on Friday. Uh, this big news was the top backer. Uh, AEW President Tony Khan has complimented Riley many times. Uh, there is something missing in this article that I read elsewhere, so I'm going to say it with a uh, with kind of a take it with a grain of salt because I, I would have thought that Fightful of all people would have put it. Why am I writing Fightful? Of course they would fuck that up. Anyway, never mind. I'm going to just say it as is. The guy replacing Kevin Riley is apparently the guy who was running sp uh, content on HBO when HBO decided to end uh, their boxing deal with HBO. Uh, apparently, he didn't like combat sports and got away from it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Warner Media TNT replacement. Let's see if Google can help us out with this conversation. Marcus... Assuming they did replace a guy who hates combat sports, are you concerned about TNT's uh, ability to keep uh, keep uh, um, AEW happy or vice versa? Specifically, do you think AEW can keep TNT happy? I do, uh, because they're not... I mean, I think a lot of people, and I, I was listening to some other people talk about this, like they're kind of harking back to what happened with, he, with uh, WCW. Mm -hmm. But I by the time the hammer, the, the nail got put in their coffin, the final nail, I should say, they had already hammered several nails in their own coffin themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, where the company kind of ran itself into the ground. I think TNT, uh, well, AEW specifically, has a lot of good pieces in place. Um, I think, well, didn't they just net their, their highest rating since, like, the, the, uh, the pandemic? So, I think so. At least in the, uh, yeah, in, in the, uh, the prime demo. And, and I definitely think it's a, it's a perception... Uh, if it is a sore perception of the new guy coming in, I think it'll definitely be something different. And for everybody, really, when these crowds come back, because they, they always have some uh, real Riley crowds. Um, however, I mean, it, it is a thing. When you have somebody who can pull your plug and they're just not a fan of what you do, it's almost like in the back of your mind, it's like, what are they just, what small L are they waiting for us to take so they can use it as an excuse? you know, to get something, you know, different to goof off their network. Like, one of the saddest things we had to do as Impact fans was that Destination America stint <laughs> because they had to integrate concepts of shows that would air after Impact into the show. So people would be r randomly 
wrestling with barbecue equipment around the ring and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, my God. That's why I thoroughly, furthermore, enjoyed Pop because they were, they were just on the channel and they let them do their thing. And Pop had some actually good content. But mm-hmm. um, I digress. Like, I, I, I do think uh, they could they could continue to make the network happy. It's just uh, it's going to be interesting. Because, you know, there's so many things being shifted right now. Like, DC paddock got decimated, you know. Um, so, you know, they, they might be on a slippery slope. Um, so, um, but I wouldn't be too, too worried because they're not exactly in the doldrums. But you got to keep an eye out, man. Like, you got somebody that you reporting to and they don't even like what you do, it's 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 a tricky thing. So now you you basically just got to bring in the money, so they don't have no uh thing to shut up, you know. And that's part of the problem. Uh, this is exactly what happened, essentially with uh, WCW. They had a merger, T and uh, uh, TV. Uh, what was it? Time? What the fuck were they called? Uh, Turner Time Broadcast. Warner? Turner Broadcast merged with AOL to become AOL Time Warner, and uh, now they're just uh, Time Warner, I think. Uh, and or no, Warner Media. And so during that merger, they decided that they didn't want wrestling on their channel anymore. So when the TV contracts came up in 2001, they well, they just said, "Fuck you, you're done." Now the guy taking over is named uh, I just just found Casey Bloys, and he was the head of HBO programming, uh, who has been promoted to oversee content especially for new streaming services, HBO Max, as well as sister outlets uh, on TBS and TNT. So, Bloys was the guy who ended boxing on HBO. Uh, I looked for something on, on search engines to see if, if there's a reason why, and it basically just, it was all just boilerplate jargon, like, we appreciate the 45 years of boxing on HBO. Blah, blah, blah. So, we could see a repeat again. And if that's the case, you know, who knows? And, and here's the thing with TV contracts. They can be ended at any time. I know that's not exactly something that people talk about, but, you know, there's a reason why a lot of TV you know, shows get canceled despite, you know, such strong ratings or strong praise or what have you. So it's very, very possible that AEW, if they slip hard enough and far enough before the end of their contract, that they get canceled anyway, or at least move to, like, a death night, like Saturday at midnight. That wouldn't be good. That wouldn't be good at all. And I think they're live. Isn't AEW live? Yeah, they were. They were. Some, of the, some of the stuff we saw was taped, but I do think, yeah. Yeah, at this point, yeah, they're probably live, yeah. So that's even more expensive. Yeah, yeah, even with, uh, you know, the limited uh, roster that they use. But um, it's even more interesting because, like you said, with the, the contract thing, you can, you can almost relate to what we see with uh, WWE. Mm-hmm. Like, the Gallows and Anderson probably thought this stuff was secure, and they got yanked. Mm-hmm. So, you know, those, those new five-year deal extensions don't mean squat, you know? Yep. So, it'll be interesting to see what happens with AEW if Warner Media decides that they have had enough with them. Uh, but, you know, as of right now, there's no signs that they're going anywhere, but it is something to keep an eye on. <clears throat> Speaking of keeping an eye on things... Yoshihashi has won a title. The end is nigh. Uh, eight teams entered the There's... tournament to crown New Japan's never open weight six man tag team champions. Uh, the winners were Yoshihashi, uh, Ishii, and Goto. So, pretty much, you know, killer stable group. You know, Marcus, I joke about Marcus all the time, like his favorites of New Japan. But Ishii and Hiroki Goto are two of his legit favorites. Yeah, yeah. Then you have hey, to I'm having for Yoshi. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, I like Hashi. Um, a lot of times he plays uh, the guy. Like anytime he gets a big win, I'm always shocked just because of how he's uh kind of consistently woven into the narrative of New Japan. He's always the missile. Like I think I can, I think I can. He's the Zack um, Ryder he, of New Japan. <laughs> yeah, so it's cool to hear that they you know got the, the six man tag straps, um, specifically you know go. I mean somebody like Ishii. Doesn't necessarily need a title, but it's cool to see him get something. So, yeah, I like I like that tandem. I mean that that trio. So that's uh, that that's good to hear, you know. And finally, we didn't talk about it last week, but we'll talk about it tonight. The XFL, bought by The Rock. 
I know it's kind of old news at this point, but it's still interesting, and there's a little little little, little nugget out there that we can talk about. Apparently, word is that uh, Fox Sports is interested in doing business with XFL. Uh, I don't know if they would just want to be in the rock business or if they're actually if they saw what you know. I think they were on NBC and ESPN last year, and they saw what they uh, did in in the spring, where they had some legitimately good numbers. Uh, so, uh, with everything kind of considering, with the, with the way the XFL did in in ratings, with the with the branding, because I thought the St. Louis Battlehawks were a great fucking brand. Oh, what a cool lo- looking uh, group! And I think the DC Defenders were pretty dope too. Um, with with all that kind of out there, uh, I, I I would be interested to see how how they go about this, Marcus. Uh, is the idea of an XFL reboot for the third time enticing to you? Uh, did you even watch the first one? Or the second one, I should say? No, um, I, caught, I caught a couple of highlights, but never really sat down and allowed myself to be glued to the screen. I mostly just kind of went off your uh, your takes on it, because I know you're not going to sit down and watch nothing that's <laughs> garbage at this point. But uh, Nope. Yeah, I mean... I, I do think a lot of it is people want to be in the rock business. I mean, you know, you can say what you want about how you feel about his movies, his acting, uh, those sorts of what have you, but rock's not in the business at this point to make, like, outrageously stupid business decisions. Like, he's one of the most successful, sought-after guys in Hollywood for a reason, and the fact that he's gone in all this success with his uh, ex-wife is even more commendable and amazing, and... Ironically enough, I think they kind of made history because wouldn't she be like the first woman uh, to own a league? Yeah, something I, like that. I I don't know if she's because the, there's a, I think the Buffalo Bills are owned by a woman right now. Um, ah, but I, I don't quote me on that. But she is among yeah. the few to be in charge. Uh, I think she's the first woman to be in charge of a league or to be co in charge of a league because like there's no. Well, outside of the WNBA, um, I think it, I think it's like the first woman in charge of football operations. I think is 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 what she made history in. Got you. So you know, uh, Ron, you know a lot of you know rock on and a lot of that press, but that's you know to be commended for her too because she put in on that as well. But uh, yeah, I do think a lot of it is to you know being a rock business, and naturally so. I and mean, like I said, the guy doesn't miss. Um, unless it's, you know, him trying to reboot Baywatch, but, um, so yeah, it's going to be interesting seeing what they do. Like I said, I mean, you know, with the stuff he did doing with Titan games and obviously we were fan of ballers, this seems like a natural transition, you know, and, and, and if it gets, gets spite Vince McMahon, I'm even more of a fan of it. So, yeah, I don't, I, you know, we're fans of anyone who, who fucks with Vince, but uh, as far as him spiting him, I don't think that's why he bought it, which disappoints me because I would love that to be the reason. Like, now, fuck Vince McMahon. Just, just now nah, I'm good. Nah. Oh, yeah, that's that. Me saying that is exclusively knowing how petty Vince is. So he can find a reason to get pissed out. Like, it, apparently it was rumored that, like, he was heated the day of the sale. Not like the behind the scenes of Raw SmackDown ain't chaotic enough. I could imagine somebody his age getting his feelings about that. But The Rock clearly, you know, like I said, he's not going to do something unless he thinks he can move something and get back at Vince is like small beans at this point because he basically can kind of just make one call and be um, pretty much the guy if he wanted to come back. So, you know. I know for me, I'm definitely going to be paying attention as soon as uh, the XFL and details of it are announced. Part of the problem is there were a lot of real good players that were on the XFL teams. And I think if you're going to have a significant run, one of the things you need to do is secure some of these guys to, to deals that are more than just a year. Uh, you know, that, that's part of, of, I think, the problem with the XFL in its entirety and some of these spring leagues that have popped up over the last few years um, is that they don't really know how to keep guys around long term. Um, Jordan Tayamu was the uh, quarterback for the St. Louis Battlehawks, and he was a rising star in the, uh, the, the, the group. You know, and not just in, in St. Louis, but overall he was, you know, extremely exciting, fun to watch. And I think he signed on to compete for a backup job with the, with the Chiefs. So, you know, you lose him, you know, he, he's going to go to a place and make decent money, but he's never going to get it. You know, he's not, unless Patrick Mahomes loses a limb, he's not starting anytime soon. 
So I think, you know, the, the XFL needs to find a way to have competitive deals, not to compete with the Patrick Mahomes, but to at least keep these guys away from being a third string backup. Like, if you can't offer them a better deal than a third string backup in the NFL, then, then I don't know if you should even be going forward with the league, personally. You know, I don't think the point is to have direct one-to-one comparison competition, but to have, you know, enough names where you can have an XFL brand on your own that plays on, on another set of months outside of the NFL season and have your own stars. You know, if that's not the end game, then what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting because, I mean, I was going to ask you, do you think it's something that he's going to take and, and, and completely re, rebrand and revamp? And it's something completely different. Or keep the XFL name in a different format that's not exactly football. Uh, no. I, he paid fifteen million dollars. The name is not worth fifteen million dollars, <laughs> like at all. So I have to imagine that he he bought it with the intentions of of, of hosting uh, XFL football games. I think he's going to keep the the branding the same team wise. I, I I don't see a reason why he would go away from that model, like from those, those teams specifically, uh, partly because, you know, if that was the reason, why not just start your own league? Uh, so I, I think he's going to be pretty status quo, and I think it's going to come down to how he intends on marketing and distributing this, you know, in terms of the games and, and, and the gameplay. Uh, a lot of the things that the XFL did was, was really exciting and fun, and I think they're going to keep, at least they should keep a lot of it. Uh, and I, I have to imagine The Rock's no dummy, I think he knows that his branding is big enough to get a, a network in, interested in him, in, you know, in his dumb little gladiator reboot and in the Titan games. So maybe he can do the same thing with the XFL, or maybe he already has a deal in place for content creation that we're not aware of. That's entirely possible. So maybe he knows that Fox will come knocking if he has this league, or maybe NBC will come knocking, or maybe TNT, or Disney, who knows? So I do think that The Rock has something planned already, and I think we're going to know relatively soon what he's got planned for. And I don't know if we're seeing a 2021 return, but I wouldn't be surprised. It will be interesting. Marcus, any final thoughts on anything tonight, including any other topics we did not touch on yet? Uh, don't let yourself become Marty Jannetty. Oh, Marty, what are you doing? He, he, apparently, he didn't kill anyone. Allegedly. So, you know, that's, that's a good thing. I guess. <laughs> oh, man, it's just it's just a really sad. So, like, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't show up or either on the next season or the season after next to Dark Side of the Ring. It's just... It's not good. Basically. Marty Jannetty is the dark side of the ring for season three or whatever it is. I think it's season three. Just just the entire season's focus on Marty Jannetty. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. I think we're good for tonight. Uh, Marcus, we already did our rundown. Uh, you and I will be back on the air on Thursday on twitch.tv backslash comic and game core. Uh, you can always just go to realnerdcorp.com anytime after Thursday to listen to the podcast. We'll be talking about the season finales of Doom Patrol and Stargirl before we start off with our new version of the podcast. We might keep the same name. We might change the name. I don't know what we're going to do yet. But I think we'll be off for a week or two, and then we'll come back with our full series review of uh, The Legion, the 2004-era DC cartoon from Kids WB. That'll be fun. Yep. Zach and I are on tomorrow. Twitch.tv backslash Wrestling Underground every Wednesdays at 9 p.m. as we talk about Impact. Impact Wrestling. Making an impact. Uh, so we'll catch you up on everything that happened then. And then, of course, every Tuesday, we're on here. Twitch.tv backslash Wrestling Underground at around 10 p.m.-ish Eastern Standard Time. All times are Eastern Standard, just so everyone's aware. Uh, but you can always go to our website, and there's a schedule there and times there and all that good stuff. So we're done. We'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. And Mark and I will see you guys on Thursday. So with all that being said, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for checking us out. Thanks for giving us a chance. For Marcus Green, I'm Chad Porto. So remember to always watch more wrestling. I fucked up the outro. And Marcus, take it home.
Good night.